raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Yes. There's Good somebody evening. who has a cat. There's somebody who has a camera lens blocked. Addie Kramer, is that correct? Mm. If you're going to be speaking tonight, you have to have your camera on and you have to be sworn in. It has to be a visual audio. That's all right. It looks like I'm having some difficulties. Thank you, though. Are you planning on speaking? No, sir. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, Ms. Wells. You ready to start? Yes. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of City Council. For the record, Kate Wells, Chief Assistant City Attorney. Also present this evening is Toyin Ina Hargret, Senior Assistant City Attorney in our litigation practice group. The last item on tonight's agenda is before council based upon a special magistrate's recommendation from a request for relief filed by CF Development 2 LLC or ZOM pursuant to section 70.51 of the Florida statutes, otherwise known as the Florida Land Use and Environmental Dispute Resolution Act. I want to make a few brief comments before providing the history of this application and the details of the proposed settlement. Unlike the standard rezoning applications considered earlier this evening, anytime city council considers a settlement proposal, your role is legislative and it allows council to consider items outside of the city's land development code and comprehensive plan, including but not limited to the impact and public interest resulting from the proposed settlement. After I conclude my presentation, you will hear from Scott Steady, who is retained by the city and ZOM to be the special magistrate. Once Mr. Steady makes his presentation on the mediation process that we followed and explains his recommendation, you will hear from city staff, planning commission staff, the applicant, the public, and then provide the applicant with an opportunity for rebuttal. And finally, as you consider the testimony and evidence entered into the record of tonight's hearing, Please remember that although the special magistrate's recommendation is a public record, actions or statements of representatives for the city and for ZOM are evidence of an offer to compromise and inadmissible in any proceeding. I mention this in the event city council is concerned about the possibility of establishing precedent if the special magistrate's recommendation is approved. At your December 12th, 2019 meeting, City Council denied the rezoning from IG, Industrial General, to PD Plan Development, which would have allowed the development of a multifamily project containing 216 dwelling units within six buildings. Thereafter, a request for relief was filed by ZOM on January 10th, which alleged that ZOM had met its burden in establishing consistency with the comprehensive plan and land development code and that it had met its burden with respect to the requested waivers. In addition to the request for relief, Zom filed a petition for writ of certiorari in circuit court, wherein Zom seeks to quash the city council's decision, alleging that the record lacked competent, substantial evidence to support the denial, and that city council failed to adhere to the essential requirements of law, insofar as it considered policies in the comprehensive plan regarding hurricane evacuation times as opposed to shelter space mitigation. On March 18th of this year, over the city's objection, the circuit court granted a conditional stay in the litigation based upon the pending 7051 proceedings. The stay in litigation of the petition for writ of certiorari remains in place today. Now, turning your attention back to the procedural history of this evening's hearing with respect to the 7051 proceeding, when the request for relief was originally filed with the city, my office provided counsel with a memorandum describing the administrative proceeding under section 70.51 Florida statutes. It involves a two-step process, the first of which requires the special magistrate to conduct an informal mediation during which the city and ZOM consider alternative developments responsive to counsel's decision to deny the application. In this case, the special magistrate conducted an informal mediation on March 13th. 
During the mediation, Zom presented a revised site plan intended to address the basis for denial. Comments were received from those members of the public who elected to participate and from city representatives. At the conclusion of the mediation, the city, Zom, and the special magistrate felt that progress had been made and we agreed to cooperate in finalizing the site plan that is before you this evening. The applicant filed the revised site plan on March 19th including proposed conditions of approval, and the special magistrate, by order issued on April 24th, recommends that City Council accept this proposal. Tonight's hearing is part of the first step of the administrative process and requires City Council to consider the modifications to the site plan as a proposed settlement. If City Council rejects the mediated resolution, the second step in the administrative process will commence and the special magistrate will hold a hearing to consider the facts and circumstances set forth in the request for relief to determine whether city, city council's action in December of 2019 is unreasonable or unfairly burdens the property. The project before you is different than what was denied in December, and so is your role tonight. As I mentioned at the outset of tonight's hearing, you are considering a settlement proposal and thus your action tonight is legislative. The previous site plan proposed 216 units in six buildings and a clubhouse. In addition, the previous site plan requested four separate waivers, including a request to remove five non-hazardous grand trees, a request to remove up to 90% of the trees on the site, a reduction in the number of loading bays, and a reduction in the number of parking spaces from 360 to 310. When Council previously considered the rezoning application, footprint of some of the structures were located within the boundary of the coastal high hazard area and thus required compliance with the goals, objectives, and policies within the coastal management element in the city's comprehensive plan. The denial was based in part upon ZOM's failure to meet its burden of proof, establishing compliance with coastal management element objective 1.2 and its failure to meet the criteria for approval of the waivers. The site plan for your consideration this evening proposes a clubhouse and a total of 214 units located within five buildings, one of which includes six townhomes. A quick side note, the townhome component was added in response to comments from Stephanie Pointer regarding the need for three bedroom units. Further revisions to the site plan include removal of all structures from the boundary of the coastal high hazard area and the removal of the previously requested waivers. Removing the waivers to be consistent with the code means the applicant does not have to justify the waivers they were previously asking for. Further, since less than 50% of the property is located in the coastal high hazard area and none of the building footprints are within the coastal high hazard area, the applicant does not have to comply with the goals, objectives, and policies in the coastal management element. Finally, ZOM offered the following conditions. One, the developer will agree to an additional certification that all grand trees on site will be preserved. Two, developer will agree to certify that the tree canopy within the city's property immediately to the west of the site will not be disturbed by the development of the project. Three, the developer will agree to implement and fund a total of five intersection murals and or crosswalk to classroom paintings in collaboration with neighborhood representatives consistent with the mayor's program to improve safety through art. And four, the developer at its expense will construct two heart recommended bus stop improvements near the intersection of Inner Bay Boulevard and Manhattan Avenue. If the revised site plan is approved this evening, I ask that the conditions offered by ZOM be added to the site plan between first and second reading. Following receipt of the revised site plan, I personally contacted each person who attended the mediation. Stephanie Pointer, who lives within the notice area, acknowledged ZOM's effort and represented that while she was not in love, she wouldn't oppose the project. In a regular rezoning or quasi-judicial hearing, like all the other hearings we've held this evening, City Council looks solely at whether the applicant has demonstrated by substantial and competent evidence that the project meets the city's regulations and is consistent with the comprehensive plan. But because this is a settlement proposal, there are other factors that City Council must take into consideration, 
including the fact that if the settlement proposal is approved, the petition for writ in case number 20 CA 000321 and the 13th Judicial Circuit will be dismissed with prejudice with each party bearing its own attorney's fees and costs. Pursuant to section 70.51, City Council has three options this evening. First, after hearing all of the evidence and testimony and after taking into consideration the other relevant matters in the pending litigation, City Council may accept the Special Magistrate's recommendation and proceed to implement the recommendation. In this case, implementation of the Special Magistrate's recommendation requires Council to adopt a motion approving the development proposal and placing the ordinance on first reading. And of course, a second reading will be required. On the other hand, if City Council determines that ZOM has failed to meet its burden, and after taking into consideration the other relevant matters in the pending litigation, then City Council may reject the Special Magistrate's recommendation. And finally, City Council may modify the recommendation and implement the modified recommendation with SOM's acceptance of the modifications. So unless you have any questions for me, I will turn the presentation over to Mr. Steady. Thank you. Any questions? Very good. Okay, right. thanks, Kate. This is Scott Sherman. Can you hear me? Who is speaking? Oh, it's Mr. This Steady. is uh, Scott Steady. Okay, right. great. Chairman, members of City Council, this is Scott Steady, the special magistrate in this matter. I only have a few comments uh, to follow up with Kate said. One is a procedural issue, so everyone understands. Under Chapter 7051, uh, those parties that participated in the original city council hearing that might have commented don't necessarily have a right to participate in this process. They actually have to indicate a desire to actually participate. So very few people know that. Uh, but your city staff in these processes uh, really encourage the developer to allow all participants at the city council to participate in this process. And ZOM did that. So everyone that participated, commented, submitted evidence at the city council meeting were allowed and did, as far as I recall, participated in our uh, mediation on March 13th. And really what you're gonna hear again with staff come up when they speak and the applicant, is the application has changed significantly. Uh, and Kate went through it and you're gonna hear it again, so I don't think you have to hear it three or four more times, but you're gonna find that there was a substantial change to the uh, site plan that I think is, is uh, makes a much better project for the city and for the residents. So uh, unless there's any comments, I would say during the process, uh, Zom was very cooperative in negotiating with the city and your staff uh, on your behalf, I think did a good job of, of tweaking what they proposed. So what before you today is I, rec I would recommend. Um, so I suggest we move forward with the presentations. Okay, who's next? Uh, Mary Samaniego, can you please share my screen? Thank you, this is um, REZ 1969. It's a PD application. Um, the Development Review and Compliance has reviewed this petition and found it consistent with the applicable City of Tampa land development regulations. Again, as Ms. Wells stated, should it be the pleasure of City Council to approve this application, there are further modifications to the site plan found within your staff report to be made between first and second reading in addition to conditions provided by the applicant. Um, as far as background, um, this application was denied again on December 19th, 2019. The applicant is proposing um, to develop the property at 7701 Inner Bay Boulevard from the current zoning district of Industrial General to plan development to construct a multifamily residential project. The 9.31 acre property is currently occupied by a warehouse and distribution use and is located one lot to the west of the Inner Bay Boulevard 
South Lois Avenue intersection. The site is surrounded by retail and office uses to the east and west within the IG zoning district. A plan development file number REZ0475 uh, to the south for townhomes. A plan development file number Z02757 to the north for apartments and a plan development REZ1646 to the northwest for townhomes. Um, changes from the previous denied application site plan to the current one, as again stated by the city attorney, reduction of number of units from 216 to 214, elimination of all waivers, and the, retaining the existing location of the stormwater drainage canal that's currently in place. Um, requests of summary, they're currently asking for 214 um, dwelling units within five buildings and a clubhouse. Um, the proposed setbacks are five feet to the north, to the south, 25 feet, east, seven feet, and west, seven feet, and the maximum building height is 60 feet. Based on the proposed number of dwelling units and bedrooms, a total of 362 parking spaces are required and 362 are being provided. All the proposed parking is surface with vehicle access for the property from one two-way driveway on Inner Bay Boulevard. Here is the subject property um, and an aerial photograph. This is the existing warehouse use that I described. Here's Inner Bay Boulevard. Um, where my um, cursor is, is the existing drainage canal. Again, that will be retained with the site plan. There are PDs um, to the north and to the um, east for other um, multifamily or townhome developments, as well as to the south with an industrial use to the west. Here is the current site plan under consideration tonight. Again, there are five total residential buildings, one, two, three, four, four apartments and multifamily. There is one set of um, attached single family that will be um, six units within one building. There is a clubhouse along Inner Bay Boulevard um, that will serve the entire site. All parking is surface parking. The existing drainage canal but will be retained. There is a driveway connection to extra um, required parking that is to the um, far north of the site. Um, with And the um, circles on the site plan are the protective radius for trees that will be preserved. Again, there are no waivers requested with this application, including there are no um, environmental or natural resources related waivers. Um, the tree table and the natural um, resources arborist report inventory is included in the site plan with the required tree table that shows the debits and credits of trees to be retained um, and to be removed. And again, they're within their required number of retention. Here are the elevations for the clubhouse as proposed. Um, staff will remind city council that elevations are just for mass and scale in this instance and are not held to any architectural detail because the site is not within one of the city of Tampa overlay districts nor within a regulated historic district. Here is a um, elevations of the proposed attached single family units. And then these are the elevations front and rear of the multifamily residential units and the left and right. That concludes my presentation. Again, I will remind City Council that the development review and compliance staff did find this consistent with the applicable City of Tampa Code of Ordinances. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who's next on this? Quick question to staff. Do we have Planning Commission staff? We have Mr. Collins on the line here. Uh, Councilman Dink Fowler had a question. So, um, just clarification for the record: the uh, the project, or the residences, the residential units in the project were all moved away from the coastal high hazard zone. 
on the revised site plan the same year ago? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Planning Commission, is it is it you now? Go ahead, uh, Danny Collins. Can you share my screen, please? This is Danny Collins. <clears throat> this is Danny Collins with your Planning Commission staff. Um, our next, our final case is in the South Tampa Planning District, and more specifically, uh, within the Gandy Sunday South neighborhood. Uh, um, the closest public recreation facility is Port Tampa's Community Center, which is within a half mile to the west of the subject site. Um, the subject site is located within proximity to transit with transit service available at the corner of Manhattan Ave Avenue and Interbay Boulevard. Um, the, sub the subject site is within evacuation zone A. Um, the Planning Commission staff has determined um, that the subject site is not located within the coastal high hazard area per CM policies 1.1.3 and CM policy 1.1.4. Here's an aerial map of the subject site and surrounding properties. Um, the subject site is just on the north side of Interbay Boulevard, um, just, just uh, to the west of uh, South Lois. Um, here is the adopted future land use map. Um, subject site is within that TU24 um, future land use designation. Um, there is uh, some residential tend to the south of the subject site and also uh, residential um 20 um to the south um and then the area to the north east and west is surrounded by that tu 24. um the planning commission staff had has reviewed the request and found uh the request supports uh, several policies in the comprehensive plan um the applicant is proposing a future pedestrian connection to the western portion of the site connecting the site to the future park um to be developed as part of the south tampa greenway um, the applicant is also providing a sidewalk connection from the existing sidewalk in, on Interbay Boulevard, uh, which connects Interbay Boulevard to the multifamily uh, residential building. Um, the sidewalk also provides internal uh, connections within the site. Um, the PD uh, will also provide housing opportunities for Tampa's growing population and will be developed, um, will encourage, or will develop the site uh, within the South Tampa Planning District and create opportunities there. Um, based on those considerations, the Planning Commission staff finds the request consistent with the City of Tampa Conference plan. Do we have any questions for the Planning Commission at this time? Okay, hearing none, I believe we have uh, the attorneys for the applicants uh, online. Is it uh, Mr. Gardner at this time? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Good evening, Truett Gardner, 400 North Ashley Drive. I have the privilege of being here on behalf of ZF Development 2, which is a subsidiary of ZOM Development. Attending with me are Tyler Hudson, Kyle Clayton with ZOM, and Christopher Hatton, who's our traffic consultant. Virtually, and I see them up there, we have uh, Ricky Petarica, our ar arborist, as well as our civil engineer, Eddie McDonald. And then last but not least, we have Scott McLaren of Hill Warden Henderson, who has handled the litigation aspects of this case. Ms. Wells, Ms. Samaniego, and Mr. Collins have done a great job summarizing the new plan, as well as what's transpired with respect to the litigation and the successful mediation that occurred on March the 13th. I thought it'd be helpful for me to spend a few minutes on our approach and the objectives we determined after the denial in December. Given that this matter has the potential of being litigated, we brought in Scott McLaren and determined that our first objective was to strengthen our legal position to the greatest extent possible. At, Zob, at ZOM's urgency though, our second objective was to work to completely redesign the project to make it better for the neighborhood, the city, the surrounding area, and the environment specifically relating to the trees. Ironically, what we learned through this process is that our two objectives were entirely linked. I think the best way to demonstrate this linkage is to show you a few slides, and if you would, we'd like to share our screen. All right, go ahead, sir.
We don't see anything yet. Yeah, we're working on it. There's no pressure, Tyler. There's no pressure, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing it's him and not me. Okay, we can see it. You can uh, start. Thank you. Perfect. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Great. So the first side slide just shows the existing conditions. If you'll recall, this is the old Hurley Mac company. Uh, this property is set vacant and basically in this condition for the last five years. Next is our new site plan. A couple things to point out here. One, as uh, Mary mentioned, we've gone from six apartment buildings to four and then added the six townhomes. You'll, you'll see to the right is north. You'll see those six townhomes on the far right of the screen there. And then the other thing I'd like to point you to, the big change is on the east side where we retained the drainage canal and the stormwater pond, which enabled us to um, keep the trees and also uh, the, the grand trees as well. This is the new rendering. Um, wanted to point this out. One, it's attractive looking, but two, the prior plan when we had more apartment buildings was three stories. And so in order to remove ourselves from the coastal high hazard area, we reduced the number of buildings that caused us or caused Zom to increase the building size from three stories to four stories, still 60 feet, which is in compliance with the underlying IG zoning. But I point this out because in talking with our client, the changes that were made, just so you know, have resulted in an excess of a million dollars in additional cost to them. This rendering here, these are the six townhomes. Again, this was at the specific request of Stephanie Pointer and some of the other neighbors who felt like they wanted more of a, of a family environment. Previously, we had no three bedroom units and their request was specifically for townhomes. And so we added six, all of which are three bedrooms. Then as it relates to the bases of denial, um, which were twofold, the first one you'll recall was the fact that we were in the co coastal high hazard area and the elements of that kicked into this application. As stated multiple times, we are no longer in the coastal high hazard area, and so those, that element no longer applies. Secondly, with respect to the trees, we had or have eight grand trees on site. Previously, we were requesting five be removed. We are now retaining 100%, so all eight of those grand trees will be preserved. Then next, we had another waiver that reduced the retention to 10% of the trees on site. What code requires is 50%. We're able now to go way beyond code and we're retaining 77% of the trees on site. Then lastly, with respect to the parking spaces and the loading berths, if you'll recall, we were requesting a reduction in parking before. We're now going to be fully code compliant, including the visitor spaces. And then with respect to the loading berths, three were required before. We were not providing any, and we are now providing all three of those loading berths. Let's see, how do I get back to Well, I'll leave that up. And in, in summary, all the bases of denial have been addressed and all of the four waivers we were requesting have been eliminated. So we're not asking for any waivers. With that, my partner, Tyler Hudson, is gonna spend a few minutes on how we've responded to some of the other concerns that were raised, specifically those with the neighborhood. 
Thanks, Drew. Uh, good evening, Council. Tyler Hudson, 400 North Ashley Drive. As, as Drew and Kate have both uh, emphasized, the, the bases of denial were really centered around the project's inclusion in the coastal high hazard area, as well as the four different waivers. But there are a couple of other things that came up during, uh, during the hearing that we want to address and, and make clear that we've been responsive to. First, I think, I think we've heard now that there are townhomes that were the concern initially that the focus solely on one to two bedroom units uh, was maybe accidentally inhospitable to families. Um, so the townhomes have been added. There were some concerns about traffic and transit that I'll, I'll speak to, uh, as well as some concerns about, about neighborhood engagement. Um, I think, as has been alluded to originally, the proposal was for six buildings that each had a mixture of a studio, one and two bedroom apartments. Now that's down to four buildings that contain uh, the studio, one bedroom, two bedroom apartments, and then a fifth, uh, we could call it a building, it's really a row of six townhomes, uh, each of which are three bedroom units. Uh, Stephanie Pointer, one of the neighbors uh, who happens to be a realtor, thought that this would be an important offering for this fast growing part um, of the city. And so it was something that Zom was willing to do to rearrange the site. On uh, traffic and transportation, pedestrian safety is obviously something that's that's an, an issue throughout, throughout the city. Um, and Kate alluded to this earlier on. Uh, one thing that came up was a concern about, about sidewalk safety in the vicinity of this project. And so what, uh, what Zom has agreed to do is, is fund and complete uh, five uh, vision zero um, murals, uh, which uh, according to uh, your mobility department, it's not, it sounds like this is the, the largest uh, developer uh, contribution of uh, Vision Zero murals that's that's been done in the, the short history so far of the program. And these will be done uh, in conjunction with neighborhood representatives. Um, it, Zom cares about getting these done and getting these done right, but really looks forward to working with the neighborhood to make sure that they're done uh, in the right places in the Inter Bay neighborhood. And on, on screen is, is an example of a couple of those that have been done to date. Uh, secondly, related to, to Hart, um, there's there's two bus stops that are both uh, north of Inner Bay along Manhattan, one on the west side, one on the east side. And so the specific improvements that uh, Hart has requested there that we uh, that they sent us a few months ago was on the east side of uh, Manhattan. Uh, currently, there there's not much of a, a shelter. Well, there's no shelter at all. There's not much of a stop. It's in the red box there. So what's going to be done there is a, a, a standard Hart shelter like picked it on the bottom of the three photos. A uh, little more interesting on the, the west side of Manhattan, the stop to the left, that's, that's currently sitting atop a drainage field, which um, common sense would dictate is uh, not, not a good place for, for a bus shelter. And so uh, what Hart's actually requested is that Zom move uh, that shelter, really just tuck it around the corner so it's on inner bay. You see where the, the areas are there and it will be similarly improved. Uh, finally, the issue about neighborhood engagement um, and making sure that we were speaking with the right the right folks. I mean, as, as Kate and noted, and, and Scott as well, the, the neighbors were very much part of this mediation uh, and fully participated in it. Uh, we certainly want to note, I don't think we noted this at our initial presentation, but we, we do have the support of three adjacent properties that are depicted um, on screen, as well as 15 other letters of support from Interbay residents, which are uh, part of the mediation record. So that turn back over to trip. Perfect. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have. In summary, the project is redesigned, has been found to be consistent by all reviewing agencies. It is supported by the city attorney's office. It's supported by the mediator. It is supported by many of the neighbors, including some who were previously opposed to the project. And the settlement as proposed is also supported by the applicant. We feel that this is a great compromise and we respectfully ask for your support. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for the petitioner? I hear none. Do we have any public comment on this item, Madam Clerk? Yes, we do. We do have three live speakers for this item. Okay, if they um, would activate their cameras and microphones, and once they appear, we will swear them in uh, one by one and they will have three minutes to speak. Okay, just to clarify, you just want me to bring them over one by one or do you want me to bring them all over now? Just bring them all over and uh, we'll swear them all in at one time and then I'll just go one at a time. All right, sounds good. I'm here. I'm here. Do you see me? 
No. No. Okay, webcam. I share it. I see Jean. Mm -hmm. And who's next? I was dressed up for the occasion, but I had to change. Yes. <laughs> Stephanie, always last. Okay. And then we have one more. Me. Carol Ann. Carol Ann. Oh, Lordy. <clears throat> Just saying. Hey, Bill. We got to stop right. meeting like this. <laughs> this is too okay. nice in a room. If you would all three please raise your right hands, we're going to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God, yes. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start with Jean, then Stephanie, then Carol Ann. You have three minutes each. Uh, Jean, when you're ready, I'll start the clock. Why do we always last? Do y'all hate us, really? Okay. Anyway, okay, go ahead. Good evening. As y'all pointed out, my name is Jean Strohmeyer. I am president of the Inner Bay South of Gandy Civic Association, but today I'm just here as a regular citizen to, dis to discuss the proposed rezoning and development of the 214-unit apartment complex at 7701 Inner Bay. Historically, the property has been industrial. The developer bought it as industrial, but had plans to change zoning for an apartment complex. I became involved in this matter on October 5th, 2019, when a neighbor found laying in the dirt near the site a yard sign a notice to rezone. The side referenced a hearing date five days later. The city's website showed that the good neighbor notices were sent out, but nobody received them. I emailed a letter to the city council with documentation from neighbors in opposition to the project. The hearing was continued, but eventually made it to city council on December 12th. And the project was rightfully denied. Victory, we thought. <laughs> Not so fast. Because it was denied, the developer sued our city. In essence, they sued you, they sued me, and they sued our entire community who disagreed with their project. So our city attorneys, through our tax dollars, had to defend the lawsuit at the risk of losing the lawsuit and subjecting the city and taxpayers to potentially paying millions of dollars in judgment and God knows what, they mediated. And we watched. While the specific mediation proceedings are confidential in nature, they reached an agreement with the altered property plans, which are, which are better, but do... To, uh, but for us, it's still just another apartment complex, which brings me here today with an opportunity to share with everybody a few of the many lessons that we've learned along the way. One lesson is that no matter what we want for our own community, we cannot fight City Hall, nor can we fight the big money developers. The cards are stacked up against us, especially for we the people south of Gandhi. We learned that once, over, once our overbuilding problems come this far to city council, it's already too late. This rezoning should have been denied in the beginning based on the approved Tampa Comprehensive Plan 2040, which specifically states that SOG is an established neighborhood and there should be no increase in density. This should have been denied as soon as the developer purchased an industrial property with no plans for industry, which would have brought jobs and stability to our, our neighborhood. But it was not denied. It was approved along with a multitude of other rezoning approvals. Then they have continued to um, approve at rapid rates. And what's funny is that one of the arguments these developers are using against us is, well, that project was approved, so why shouldn't ours be approved? Our wishes, needs, and the way our quality of life will be impacted was denied. So don't worry, Mr. Developer and y'all, the city will approve whatever you want. And that brings me to the final lesson that I've learned, which is that our concerns mean nothing, and we, the people of South of Gandhi, are hereby denied. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Stephanie Pointer. Good evening. Oh, I'd like to point out that everybody spoke in my name this evening. I feel like E.F. Hutton. Um, uh, good evening. I want to say that I am the president of Central Park HUA, which directly, when you look at that little driveway across the street, that's where I live. I can walk to this project in less than five minutes. Um, I don't support it. I'm not in love with it. 
but it is what it is because we have found out and more so than anything, I say that I don't object to it any longer simply because doing so is fruitless. Um, I, I wrote a nice letter and had it all succinctly written. Um, bottom line is Zom went been over backwards, did a lot of accommodations and did a lot of work to make changes to make it more palatable. I'm going to deal with this every single day for the remainder of time that I live in SOG. And, and I plan on that probably being the rest of my life. Uh, so I, while, you know, this is just a big old plate of liver covered in ketchup for me, but you know, it's still a plate of liver. Um, I, I don't, I'm kind of, di kind of disoriented or, um, I'm, uh, um, I'd like to thank Kate Wells for being my new bestie and using my name a hundred times in her statements. Um, and, uh, you know, I, like I said, I don't love it, but I mean, what am I supposed to say? Now we know that we have to go back to the comp plan. Now we understand how this process works. And I want to thank the city council for showing us the way and leading us to the right way to do it as well as, 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 as well as the lawyers for the city. But, you know, I can't stand up here and in good conscience go, well, you can't do that because I have to live across the street from you guys. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to see these guys every single morning, every single morning for the entire rest of the time I own my house and I'm not a big mover. I'll, I'll get to enjoy this. Um, I appreciate the accommodations they made. It's much more palatable than it was to start with. And I believe that um, Mr. Clayton and the other leadership at ZOM moved wisely in this situation by moving forward to make accommodations that would make it more palatable to us. And um, I have to recognize that. And I think that's always a good thing. And Alexis here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carol Ann Bennett, you're next. I have two requests. One, I need the ability to share my screen. And two, I would like one extra minute, please. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Is the ability to share my screen up? Oh, I don't see it. Uh, All right. Clerk, if we could. Okay. I see it now. Get that done. There we go. We can see it. Go ahead. All right. Uh, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. I've lived in South Tampa my entire life. Um, Gene Duncan outlined the city's growth strategy and said, we want to encourage growth in certain parts of our city. We want people to have choices, to live in a condo or apartment or live in a suburb with a house and a yard. We want the growth to be focused in these circled areas. Areas. We want protections in place for our neighborhoods. You will see that South Tampa isn't in any of these circles. I need to stop sharing the screen now. I don't know how to do it. Stop. Did that work? Yes. Okay. Um, Rebecca Kirk told you the history of traffic concurrency, which required adequate infrastructure to be in place concurrent with development. That meant a certain level of service was identified and had to be maintained. If a road dropped below the level of service, no development could occur until adequate facilities were in place. In other words, builders were required to build the true cost of their impact on infrastructure. When this responsibility was removed, builders did not cut the prices of homes and apartments. They did not make housing more affordable. They just increased their profits. But just because builders no longer have to pay for the impact of their development, it doesn't mean the impact has just magically disappeared. What changed is that the people already living here are forced to pay the price. We and our families pay the price in time stuck in traffic. We pay the price of road work with our increased taxes. We pay the price when we can't evacuate in an emergency. We subsidize the builder's prop profits. We subsidize the moving costs of new residents. This responsibility was dumped on us even though we objected and protested and said no. We are ignored. All of these new residents need water. Why aren't they paying for it? Why should the mayor and county commissioners and city council have to tear your hair out 
well, maybe Charlie and Orlando don't tear their hair out. But um, why should you have to figuratively tear your hair out every year trying to figure out how to pay for the water the new residents need, for the police and firefighters and schools and roads and sewage the new residents need? Why aren't the new residents paying for this? Why aren't the builders who make scads of money paying for this? The city needs to say no to special treatment and say no to rezonings that put us in danger. Hillsborough County is in crisis. They had to put a moratorium on new development. If the increased density is going to increase our evacuation times and our traffic and put more burden on the current residents to pay for water and infrastructure, then you must deny the rezoning request. Stop speaking the residents of South Tampa. The young couples trying to get a start, the families who are just trying to get by, the retirees who have no way to pay for their increased insurance and new assessments on the utility bills. Make the builders and the new residents pay for their impact on our city and stop endangering us by overbuilding when no one knows how long it will take to evacuate our flood-prone peninsula. The city's good intention to do what is best for all of us is getting trampled by bullies. All these builders have to do is threaten to sue, and then they get to build whatever they want, wherever they want it, even if they bought property knowing it was not zoned for it. The growth of this city is being directed by one thing and one thing only, whatever will put the biggest profit in builders' pockets. They will steer this ship right onto the rocks, and then they will hop off with their pockets bulging. Greed should not be the manager of our growth. You should be the managers of our growth. Please deny this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone for public comment else? Um, Madam Clerk at the convention center, anywhere? There's no more live speaker on this item and there's no one at the Tampa Convention Center. And just for the records, we did receive written comments back in July of 2020 and it's uploaded on Sire. Thank you very much. All right, uh, council members, you've heard the public comment, you heard from the applicant. Uh, is there any uh, rebuttal, Mr. Gardner, anything that you wish to add? Or any questions from council members? Can, can I ask a question real fast? Councilman Carlson. Um, Mr. Gardner, um, i put you on the spot. Tell me if you sure. don't want to answer the question, but could you just explain for anybody watching if if none of the none of this was approved, what is the property currently entitled to to have on it? Is, is it what could you do there? So so build two things, and that's a great question. Uh, the underlying zoning is IG, so industrial general. The future land use category is TU24, which is a category for both. Uh, it's a transitional category, so either for residential or commercial purposes. With respect to the industrial portion, the entitlement as a matter of right for a warehousing industrial type use would be in excess of 600,000 square feet. And at our prior hearing, which we have in our slide deck today, if you're interested in seeing it, we ran just based on ITE calculations since traffic seemed to be a large issue here of what the apartment, how it stacks up compared to either warehousing or industrial type use and the PM and AM peak hour trips for what we're, we're proposing are hands down and by far the smallest when you compare those other uses that are allowed by right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other council members with questions or comments? I I'll speak. Here. Sure. Um, I, I appreciate everybody's remarks here tonight, attorneys from the public, et cetera. You know, this was a project that um, was originally voted down, obviously, by city council, myself, et cetera. Um, the, there's a number of changes that have been proposed to be made uh, by the developer, which are um, a step forward. I understand they're not enough for a lot in the community. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. From a legal perspective, um, as explained, um, the way that I see it, it kind of knocks off the legs from the stool that we used to deny this originally from a legal perspective. Um, I think we're, we're in this pointer, my friend Stephanie Pointer, and, and Stephanie is my friend. I, I know her um, husband, uh, uh, Colonel Pointer, who's a 
wonderful gentleman, um, uh, I, I think made a, um, a very, did she laugh? That's funny. Um, that uh, she made a very, very good point, which is the comp plan. And I remember Stephanie had come before to Tampa City Council a couple months ago in June, I believe it was, to uh, try to talk about that in a, in a very um, loud, uh, uh, adventurous meeting. It goes without saying. But the bottom line, the kind of the way that I explain it is that um, we're playing with the cards that we have, and the cards that we have are dealt from the comp plan. Um, and, and to change the result, uh, for more equity for the community, which I think everybody um, understands it. And that's why we got the vote that we originally did. Um, that there's got to be, in my opinion, obviously a change in that regard. We change the comp plan and we can have in the future different results. And that's certainly something that I know all council members, including Councilman Carlson, who represents the area so diligently, um, are, are working on. Uh, but those are the rules that we have. Uh, south of Gandy is an area that's suffering from a lot of development. Uh, it's, it's, I'll use the saying that I use for New Tampa on the other side of Tampa, which is that, uh, you know, south of Gandy is a, uh, uh, what is it, a size 38 waist uh, in size 36 pants, and every day they're eating it at, at McDonald's, it seems. In other words, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing, and that presents for it a lot, a lot of problems. Um, I, I think in, in, in light of the rules that we have, um, before us, and again, as I said, the legs of the stool that were used to previously deny it, I think that there is a, a, a path that, that I see. I want to hear from other folks, et cetera, um, but I think that's the path. The, the, I hate to use the word responsible, but the, I would suggest respectfully the responsible path um, uh, to go forward. Uh, we know what would happen from here. You know, mediation, uh, which was uh, uh, taken forward in this case, it's the... Um, uh, essentially that last chance power drive, so to speak, before you start going to trial. And, you know, when, when you go to mediation, you get a chance to compromise. And often both parties, almost always, I, and I'm an attorney, both parties leave mediation very, very, or slightly unhappy, I should say. Um, but you get to end the dispute and both parties um, give up something. Um, but ultimately, in a case like this, you know what you're going to get at mediation. You know what you're going to get with a settled compromise. You take this to court, whether you're going to have, um, I don't know if this is going to be a, a jury trial or a bench trial, um, but if it is a jury trial, you're going to have six people um, who's only, an, I don't know if there's a federal case or a state case, but their only um, uh, 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 method by which they're going to be on that uh, jury is through a driver's license. Um, and 100% of your case is going to be in their hands. That, that to me, is, is like Las Vegas. Um, so the benefit of, of a settled compromise during mediation is that you know what you're going to get. Um, and, and we see that here. So just some thoughts I just wanted to start off the discussion with, um, if I may, the way I'm, I'm seeing things, but I'm interested in hearing from everybody else. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Sir? Councilmember Goods? You know, these decisions are, are never, never easy. They, they just aren't. And when you're in a ball game, you bring in a relief pitcher, and that's, that's what has happened here. They threw a strike. And the magistrate has thrown a strike, and we are dealt a hand that we might not can, uh, can recover from. I think that Councilman Vera is right. If you want to change the game, you've got to change the rules. So I, I, I always look for answers. Don't tell me what you can't do, what you can't do. At this point, Garner and the group um, uh, came back with some things they could do. So you have to commend them for that effort. They made some changes. May not be perfect what community wanted, but they did try to make a gallant effort to make a lot of different changes. I understand the South Gandy area. I used to work at Robinson High School. My son is the Dean Fellow, so I'm very familiar with that area. I tell you, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of growth since I've been down there, you know, when I was a resource officer down there. So I can see the growth and the impact is made. But what I would tell uh, the ladies is that we have to change the game to be able to change the rules. So uh, I, I'll listen to other councilmen, but right now I think that the cards have been dealt 
and we've got the hand in place and preparing that the uh, measures already dealt us the hand that we may have to deal with tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, just to make a statement, um, um, I appreciate what uh, Mr. Gardner and his colleagues have done, and and uh, and the developer. They've obviously met with the community and tried to to uh, deal with this. This is a, a systemic problem that the city is dealing with, where there is there are entitlements to on properties, but yet when people buy the property, they think that there's an entitlement to change the entitlements, and the public doesn't always want that. And the and we cannot. We are, we are elected to represent the public and defend the public and the public interest. And um, we, if the, the city went through a lawsuit years ago and lost, I think, $4 million, um, in business, you if somebody sues you, you fight back and you keep fighting until you win. And it may cost the city a lot of money to fight litigation on these cases, but ultimately we have to stand up for the rights of our people and our community, and we cannot set the expectation that in, that there is an entitlement to change the entitlements. The reason why they, the barriers are there is so that we can weigh all the different evidence. And I think that we have to stand up for uh, for the, the interests of the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Uh, if if I may. Oh. Go ahead. I was just gonna say that I, I think when, when we're talking about changing the rules, um, it's uh, don't we have correct me if I'm wrong, and this has nothing to do with this case. A workshop on October 22nd on south of Gandhi. Am, am I right? It's a it's a big variety of stuff. I'll tell you what it is. Um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I can respond to that. On October 22nd, we have quite a few land use items that are going to be workshopped. With regard to the comments from council this evening about wanting to change the rules of the game, that is the legislative decision and that is appropriate for discussion in October. But to make a decision tonight based upon council's desire to change the rules of the game in response to the public's requests would be inappropriate. So is your legal advice tonight to um, not hate the player but hate the game? I'm joking. I'm sorry. <laughs> you Anybody have to work the comp plan as it currently is adopted and not as you wish it to read. Well, I appreciate, um, you know, all the work on, on, on all sides. You've done the best you can. I think you've reached out to the community. You've included people. Uh, that are directly affected or nearby or, or have the vested interest in, in making sure that the development is right in the uh, in that neighborhood. Um, but uh, Mr. Gardner mentioned it, you know, it's found consistent over and over and over. It's met the code. It's you've gone above and beyond to making sure that this is uh, is is being done right and you're being respectful of the people. Mind you, we can't all agree on, on everything, but uh, you've taken the extra measures and the extra steps to, um, to make sure that this is a good project and that it's, that it's done properly. If there's no other comments or questions from council members, is there a motion to close? Uh, before we do that, may we please hear from, the, uh, from Mr. Gardner if there's any closing comments that he wants to make before we close the public hearing. Mr. Gardner, is there anything you'd like to say? Yes, actually, Tyler is going to go first and address uh, Ms. Bennett, and then I'd like to close with addressing uh, Ms. Grohmeyer and, and Ms. Pointer as well, as well as some of the, the issues you've raised. Yeah, thanks, thanks Drew. Um, Councilman, I, I think I'll, I'll, each each of you or some of you have really given most of uh, the rebuttal that, that I had intended uh, to give in, in, in that we, we need to be evaluated, I think, on the law, uh, the comprehensive plan as, as it is today. Um, it can, it can be challenging to change the law um, if you don't like the outcomes you have. I've had some, uh, some experience in that, but the comprehensive plan is, a, is the tool um, to guide development. Uh, it is changeable. You, you approve some plan amendments uh, today, and I think that uh, October 22nd, that's going to be a great opportunity to, to hear from the public about where the direction of growth should go and, and how to incentivize or disincentivize growth if that's the decision. But, um, 
But those decisions haven't been made, made today. Those are decisions for the future. And uh, I respectfully submit that we've, we've carried our burdens for today. Mr. Gardner. Sure, and, and not to, to lump uh, Ms. Frohmeyer and Ms. Pointer together, but there's some commonality there. One, uh, we truly appreciate them participating in the process. I hope that they feel like we did in good faith and we felt like they did as well. And I also appreciate Stephanie's comments. We've worked with her continuously and, um, and really appreciate her comments. And I know it's not easy for her to say about Zom going the extra mile and making changes uh, to make this more palatable to her. And also just respect to the, to the IG zoning category and the entitlements that come with it. There are some uses in the industrial that we talked about and the traffic that that would generate but also auto repair, outdoor storage, those types of things that I just don't think are fitting for this. And that what we propose is a much better solution uh, for this property, given its current zoning and its current future land use designation. And then finally, they, they say a good compromise is when nobody leaves the table happy. And uh, as you heard from Ms. Romeyer and Ms. Pointer, they're not entirely happy. I can tell you that, that ZOM, while they were more than willing to make compromises, this is coming at a tremendous expense to them. And so they're not entirely happy either, but I think we've arrived at a, at a much better project that removes all the waivers, um, is supported by staff, and, and we'd like to move this forward. And, and thank you and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, sir. If there's nothing else, I'd like a, a motion to close this hearing. So moved. We have a motion closed from Councilman Goose. Do we have a second? Okay. Second from Councilman Miranda, any objection? Hearing no objection by unanimous consent. Uh, this hearing is now closed. Mr. We Chairman, Martin Shelby here. Yes, sir. Um, the first order of business is to take on the issue of the council's position with regard um, to the recommended order of the special magistrate. I believe the legal department has provided you a sample motions of your options tonight um, hopefully, um, one of you has those and would be willing to make um, a, a motion relative to the settlement agreement before you have to address that before you take the issue of that ordinance that you have on your agenda. Would anybody like to make a motion at this time? Is, do we do, is it a motion to accept the uh, uh, recommended uh, settlement agreement? Would that be the proper lingo? Miss Wells, that's the, that's the that's the start of it. Um, the options available to City Council are to either accept the settlement, uh, the special magistrate's recommendation, uh, where he's recommending the council approve the settlement. The other option is to deny it. The third option is to modify it. However, Zom would have to agree with the modifications. So the first item for business uh, for council's business this evening is to take action on the special magistrate's recommendation. If city council approves the recommendation, you then place the ordinance for rezoning on first reading. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll see where this goes. I'll start by uh, our, uh, a motion for approving the um, uh, mediated settlement agreement. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Vieira. We have a second from Councilman Goods. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Dinkfelder? Yes. Aniscalco? Yes. Carlson? No. Citro? No. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carry with Carlson and Citro voting no. Thank you very much. We now have the substitute ordinance being presented. Who would like to take that? Uh, I know there were a couple of no votes. Council member Vieira, would you like to take the substitute yes, ordinance? Sir. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chair. Um, I move a substitute ordinance being presented for first reading consider, and this is 23, our uh, yes, first sir. reading consideration uh, and an ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 7701 Interbay Boulevard in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification, IG industrial general to PD plan development, residential multifamily providing an effective date. 
Do we have I'll a second? second that, Mr. Chairman, and that means that's resolution uh, 19-69, number 23. Yes, sir. We have a second from Council Member Miranda. Roll call vote, please. Vieira? Yes. Boots? Yes. Dean Felder? Yes. Manis Calco? Yes. Carlson? No. Citro? No. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carry with Carlson and Citro voting no. Second reading and adoption will be held on October 22nd at 5.01 p.m. Thank you very much. That's it. That's the whole agenda. Thank you very much, all the participants. And we have quite a few people you can log off at this time. That concludes item number 23. We will now go to information reports and new business by council members. Council member Miranda, do you have anything, sir? I have one, sir. I'd like to yes. make a motion to prepare either a resolution or accommodation celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Florida Aquarium to be represented at their board meeting on November 12, 2020. So second. Second. All right, we have a second from Councilman Citro. Is there any objection to the motion? Hearing none by unanimous consent without any objection, the motion passes. Anything else, sir? That's it, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilman Citro, do you have anything tonight? Very quickly, Mr. Chair. Uh, the city, the community, and to people who care about the environment, lost a dear friend, Mr. Kent Bailey. Hmm. Uh, I heard him say many, many times that there is much work to be done. Kent, you will be missed. And without you, there is much, much more work to be done. And I hope that we can, um, that we can carry on. Uh, one more thing, Mr. Chair, uh, my dear friend, Papa, I'm thinking about you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. We appreciate those words for Kent Bailey, who was a true champion in this community and an all around nice guy. Nice guy, but he fought for what he believed in with the Sierra Club, with the environment, whatever it was. He was always there. You were, you were always sure to see him fighting and, and being a champion. Thank you very much. Councilman Carlson, do you have anything, sir? No, just to add to that. Um Please remember in, in Ken's honor and in Dina Levengood's honor that both of them uh, fought um, the toilet to tap program and uh, Dina act, literally died in the middle of fighting that and Kent, uh, even the last time I talked to him, was still ready to fight it. So as you hear about that coming up, please remember that they they fought in their last um, months and moments to uh, to fight that program as well as many other important projects. And there are many others behind them that will come and fight it as well. But thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, and I, if I remember, I think Ken called into our budget meeting two weeks ago, or I'm thinking of somebody else. But I, you know, I heard his voice not not that long. Ago. There's that Council Member Dingfelder. Do you have anything, sir? Mr. Chairman, you took the words out of my mouth. Uh, yeah, Kent was a great guy. I think I met him 25 years ago. Uh, I was on the Audubon board and he was on the Sierra board and um, super guy, but he did. He called in to us uh, a couple of weeks ago at our budget hearing and uh, had some issues to raise. So anyway, he'll be missed uh, greatly. And um, like Bill said, many others will carry on as, in his legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilman Good, do you have anything at this time, sir? Yes, sir. I got a couple. I'll make them brief. Number one. A motion to remove the ATU uh, accommodations to be brought back in accordance with uh, Chairman, I mean, uh, uh, Councilman uh, Citro's motion regarding City of uh, Tampa staff accommodations. Do we have a second? Uh, second. second. All right, second for Councilman Citro. Any objection? <laughs> Hearing none by unanimous consent without any objection, the motion passes. What else, uh, Councilman Goods? You know, we've been fighting the uh, contracts for a while we've sent several back and i uh been looking into uh, some of the programs that are related to our uh, equal business opportunity program chapter 26.5 i would uh, i'd like to make a motion for a workshop on january 28 2021 where the administration prepares a complete comprehensive presentation that relates to the equal business opportunity program chapter 26.5 with all the amendments which includes purchasing slash procurement minority business,
contract services and RFP slash RFQ related practices. I want to know the who, what, when, where, and how this process is operated, who oversees it, and who, who, provide, who provides uh, provide a complete uh, documentation uh, as, a, as the end result. We have a second. Second. Second from Councilman Dingfeld. Are any objection? Hearing none, by unanimous consent, and without any objection, the motion passes. Mr. Chairman, this is another, my last motion of the evening. Hope I get definitely support on this. Uh, in respect to the administration, I believe checks and balances are needed in all parts of municipal government. The Equal Business Opportunity Program is a vital program within the city, and we need to make sure that we have equity within this program. For the city charter 5.01C, city council has the right to have the city auditor to perform internal audits for this reason. I would like to make a motion to have the city auditor conduct an audit of the Equal Business Opportunity Program in its entirety to provide exactly what is being done, what is not being done, and what is needed to become compliant if we're not, and provide the completed results on January 28, 2021, before city council in a workshop. Second. We have a second from council member Carlson. Is there any objection to the motion? Hearing none by unanimous consent, the motion passes. Is that it, sir? That's it, sir. Thank you, gentlemen, for the support this evening. Mr. Goods, Councilman Goods, one more item, if you don't mind, please, for the purposes of the clerk and the purposes of the record. Uh, my understanding is your executive aid filed with the clerk. Um, your conflict form for a vote you took place on September 10th. I'd like you to add that to the list for the clerk to be received and filed tonight, please. That's fine, sir. Okay, thank you. And I'll be sending a copy of my motion to the clerk so we have an exact verbiage. I was talking a little fast to try to get through it, okay? Uh, so some of you should be listening, so she'll probably email that tonight at first thing in the morning. Councilman Vieira. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chair. Just one quick one. On um, October 27th, um, I was going to be doing a um, an event at Crossover Church on Fowler uh, for rental assistance and, and aid for um, apartment residents. Councilman Goods uh, is going to be there, and, and Kim Overman. Uh, is going to be there as well, but Crossover Church. I'll explain this motion. Is a is a um, the church that's struggling like a, like a lot of churches right now during COVID. And I asked them to host this, and and it dawns on me that hosting is not free. So I wanted authorization uh, to use my um, office funds, or I think I have a lot in there uh, to help them. So um, help them for narrowly. I want to explain it narrowly tailored to this event. One hundred and ten percent. So I motion for staff from, and I already check with uh, the powers that be on this, uh, motion for staff for revenue and finance to bring forward a resolution allowing my office to give $500 to Crossover Church to help fund a rental assistance community event to be held on October 27, 2020. Further, the said resolution be brought before council at October 15, 2020 meeting for approval. Do we have a second? second. Second. Councilman Miranda, is there any objection? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously um, without any objection uh, with, by unanimous consent. Anything else, sir? Nothing else, sir. Order received and filed. I have nothing. Uh, we have a motion received and filed from Councilman Miranda. Mr. Shelby. Yeah, well, no, why don't you take that motion, sir? That would be fine, please. Okay, we have a second from Council Member Citro. Any objection? By unanimous consent, without any objection, the motion passes. Mr. Shelby. Yes, Council. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, you sent out uh, a memo um, uh, late Monday, and it was discussing how we're going to go forward, City Council, um, if the governor does not extend the executive order, which expires. Um, right after um, midnight, I believe it's on uh, the 1st of October or the end of the day, September 30th. I just wanted to clarify th that memo because there might be some confusion. Um, the concept of needing a quorum is not the same as the quasi judicial uh, subject. It's totally two different things. So basically, Mr. Chairman, by your motion, I just want to clarify that if there is no executive order, and correct me if I'm wrong, because this is my understanding, if there is no executive order extension, then council, both the morning and the evening, 
have to appear at least a physical quorum at the Tampa Convention Center. So even if the morning meeting is audio only, the four council members at a minimum still need to be at the convention center. The evening meetings will still remain video as per the council's uh, the chairman's uh, uh, suggestion and recommendation and the council accepted. If, uh, according to what the chairman stated, if the order is extended, then we will continue with business as usual. But I just wanted to bring the council's attention so there's no confusion that if the governor doesn't extend the order, Four of you, at least, are still going to have to be at the convention center a week from today at 9 a.m., at least by 9 a.m. So Even in the a, evening? A Even in the evening? And in the end of the evening, um, it'll have to be at the convention center as well to have a quorum. That's fine. I'm happy with whatever. Uh, I'll, I, I, I will be there, but um, so just in the case that the governor does not extend the executive order, the emergency order, um remember four of us will have to be morning and night even if it's audio and virtual we'll have to be in that physical quorum at the convention center it is not open to the general public where we have a regular meeting because we're still social distancing but we'll be there with behind closed doors um doing as we do we'll just be in each other's presence and we have a, a little bit of uh, attorneys and staff uh to help with the uh, meeting and move us through and and that's it so and, and again, the people will be the people will be able to access and participate just as they always have since we started going virtual through this communication media technology. Yep. So nobody's being cut out or blocked out or shut out or no First Amendment rights are being affected. All right. Thank We're you very sunshine. much. All in the sunshine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. We're adjourned. See you next week. Thank you, sir. Good night.